Hello and welcome to the 2014 version of my drowning lecture. Uh, this lecture is primarily focused toward pre-hospital folks, so whether that's lifeguards, EMS, uh, fire, police. Um, what I want you to take away from this is how to do the most amount of good in the first five minutes of treatment of the drowning patient. As a quick introduction, my name is Andrew Schmidt. I'm an emergency medicine physician at the University of Florida in Jacksonville, a 15-year veteran ocean lifeguard, and currently director of Lifeguards Without Borders. I have no financial disclosures to report, uh, but I do want to put out a warning that there are some graphic images, both pictures and videos, involved in this lecture. Unfortunately, one of the best ways to learn is to see real-life treatment and real-life disease in action, uh, so I will be including some videos. So if you are weak-hearted or weak-stomached, I advise that you may not want to watch this lecture. To understand where we are today in terms of resuscitation and treatment, I think it's really important to understand where we've come from. Um, here you see depicted some Egyptian hieroglyphs. This is from about 1237 BC. And what you see outlined in blue, that's the Great of Aleppo. Um, he's being held upside down by two of his guards. This was during a battle uh, when he was thrown into the river. And the guards are holding him upside down in an attempt to drain water from the lungs. This is the first depiction uh, that's been found that shows early drowning resuscitation. From here we move into ancient Chinese literature. We have a couple different pictures here. On the left we're seeing someone hold a drowning victim in front of a fire, the thought being that smoke would stimulate life. On the right we see a drowning patient thrown over the back of an oxen when the animal is running around in circles uh, with the idea again of expelling water from the lungs. This next picture is always a crowd favorite. Uh, this depicts the use of a tobacco enema. Um, to use this, they would instill smoke into the rectum of a patient uh, with the thought that tobacco being a stimulant could possibly stimulate life. Uh, this is the, where the term blowing smoke up someone's ass comes from. In this next picture, uh, we see a sailor holding another sailor over a barrel and rolling him back and forth in an attempt to expel water from the lungs. And in these final pictures, we see some of the early versions of CPR. Uh, this is obviously for the rescuer who has the time and resources to build a simple machine on the beach. Uh, but we can see some uh, form of resuscitation that's starting to mimic our early forms of CPR. So obviously in modern times, we've developed some pretty cool uh, toys and techniques for helping people. Uh, we have boats and robots and helicopters we can use to go get the person. Uh, we've become very efficient in CPR, even developed machines that do CPR for us. We've also become experts in medications and antibiotics and airways and developed machines like ECMO that can provide respirations and circulation for the patient. So you may be asking yourself, why are we still talking about this? Haven't we mastered the treatment of drowning? The problem is that an estimated 97% of drowning deaths occur in the developing world. In current places that don't have all these bells and whistles, don't have all these toys, don't have all these techniques. We often get caught up in the neat new fancy machine uh, but we easily overlook the simple problem that people are continuing to drown all over the world. In addition, even in areas with fairly modern forms of public service, we're still seeing very primitive treatments. In this video, you can see officers holding a child upside down who was just pulled out of a lake in an attempt to rid the lungs of water. As you recall, we saw these same techniques depicted in Egyptian art. So despite all of our advances, there are still places that are using techniques that were used in 1237 BC. This video shows the use of fire in an attempt to stimulate life, very similar to the ancient Chinese literature that we saw. This video shows an officer throwing a child over his shoulder and running around in circles, once again very similar to the ancient texts. Here we have a treatment very similar to how the sailors would use a barrel and here we have ineffective CPR performed on a child, which will likely be no better than the CPR techniques we saw in the 1940s. By showing these videos, I in no way want to demean the efforts of the rescuers. They are all doing what they think is right for the patient. Most likely, a lot of them are, are actually just meeting the local standards. Just because one guy threw a child on his back one time and ran around in circles and it worked, that likely became the standard. I showed them to paint a picture of how a poor understanding of the basic physiology of drowning will lead to poor treatment and poor outcomes. Now for a quick overview of the total burden of drowning around the world. 
it's important to really get a good understanding of the scale of the problem that we're talking about. Overall, an estimated 388,000 deaths around the world each year. Now again, this is just drowning deaths. As we'll see in a bit, the non-fatal drowning is a huge amount of burden around the world. This is, these are the patients that have brain injury and go on to, to um, not be able to live a full life because of it. When we start adding all those patients up, it's estimated around 7.6 million people. Now, as we talked about before, around 97% of drowning deaths around the world occur in developing countries. Uh, this is important because there's a lot of focus put on new techniques and uh, new devices, um, but we're really forgetting the fact of the matter that the problem is in the developing world. You can see that in this image, which shows estimated drowning rates around the world. You see in developed nations, you're getting 1 to 2 per 100,000 deaths a year. You start getting sub into Sub-Saharan Africa, China, India, and getting much larger numbers of death rates per year. There are multiple social and geographic differences that account for this, but it's just very important to know that there's large variability around the world. Now before we get into the actual treatment of drowning, we need to understand what we're treating. Uh, we need to all be speaking the same language. Just like with any disease, if you go to 10 different doctors to be treated for diabetes, you, you want to hope that they're all speaking the same language and all have the same idea of what diabetes is. Uh, there was a study done back in 2005 which showed over the past 60 years of research, they had 33 different definitions for drowning. Uh, that's crazy. That means 33 different definitions for what exactly drowning is. They also had multiple terms used in research papers like near drowning, wet, dry drowning, secondary drowning. That just led to a lot of confusion. Because of this, when the World Congress on Drowning met in 2002 in Amsterdam, one of their major goals was to develop a standard universal definition for drowning. The standard definition which came out of that conference was the process of experiencing respiratory impairment due to submersion or immersion in a liquid. From that primary definition, you can have three possible outcomes, injury, no injury, and death. In addition, they recommended against the use of confusing terms like near drowning, wet and dry drowning, active, passive, and secondary drowning. The idea of this was to take away from the confusion of drowning and simplify it down to who is drowning, where are they drowning, and what do we need to do about it. Now there are multiple ways to describe the process of drowning, some more confusing than others, but the one thing you need to understand is that the common endpoint is hypoxia, or a lack of oxygen. This hypoxia is the primary cause of all systemic injury and death associated with drowning. If you have a firm grasp of this idea, you will know how to best treat these patients. And that is to give them oxygen. Give them oxygen any way you can. Mouth to mouth, mouth to mask, bag valve mask, respirator, whatever you have, whatever concentration, you need to get oxygen in these patients early. I always like to remind people that 21% is greater than 0%. 21% being the ambient oxygen concentration around us. If you have a bag valve mass that's not yet hooked up to an oxygen tank, start using all these patients, start getting them positive pressure ventilations. Be that person to get off the back of the truck with a bag valve mask and start giving these people ventilation. Someone will come behind you and hook them up to oxygen. It's much better than this person sitting there not breathing and getting 0%. Now this video shows an issue that a lot of rescuers have. What do we do with the foam that's coming out of their mouth? Uh, the majority of patients we resuscitate in the state are going to have foam. This is for two reasons. One, stomach contents, and two, air and water combining together to make foam. What is important to understand is that the common teaching and practice of suctioning these patients can lead to a loss of ventilation time. If you are able to get positive pressure ventilations through the foam, go ahead and bag these patients. Yes, if they have a completely obstructed airway, then we will need to use means of clearing the airway of foam and debris. But if you can get ventilations in these people, give them oxygen. Now we're going to cover CPR. With the recent push toward compressionally CPR, especially in the layperson setting, it's important to tease out exactly what that means and how it differs in the treatment of this guy, a drowning patient. If you were to come across this man on the beach or in the street, and he didn't have a pulse. It'd most likely be a cardiac cause. The way I like to describe this is the tank is full, but the engine is broken. In this type of cardiac injury, the patient has a sudden drop in cardiac function. Up until that point, his oxygen levels are fairly normal. 
it can actually hold normal for the next couple minutes. What this man needs is a new engine. He needs compressions. He needs you to pump the oxygen around his body. This is the basis for compression-only CPR. When it comes to this patient, this is most likely a respiratory cause. Yes, patients can have heart attacks that, that lead to drowning. But when you see this type of patient, you need to think of a respiratory cause. I like to describe this as the tank being empty and having an engine that works. Due to the drowning process, this patient is having a rapidly lowering oxygenation level. This leads to cardiac dysfunction. For this reason, the treatment of this patient has to include ventilations, and ventilations have to take priority. Yes, if the person is having cardiac arrest, CPR is still needed, but ventilations have to stay a part of that CPR algorithm. This is all part of the American Heart Association guidelines for CPR. It's unfortunately just tucked far in the back. For any drowning patient, treatment must follow the traditional paradigm of ABC, airway breathing circulation. To further discuss this, if you're familiar with cardiac dys dysrhythmias, you'll know that out of the hospital cardiac arrest usually involves a VTAC or V-fib dysrhythmia, usually from underlying structural disease. In comparison, a drowning cardiac arrest is usually a PEA or pulseless electrical activity. That's from hypoxia or a lack of oxygen. Now while the basic treatment is fairly similar, the way to reverse the problem is very different. The VTAC and V-fib dysrhythmias can be reversed with defibrillation. The PEA dysrhythmias can be reversed by treating the underlying cause, again in drowning the underlying cause being a lack of oxygen. Now AEDs do play a role in the treatment of drowning patients as long as oxygenation and high quality CPR are being used. In the aquatic environment, it's important to know that AEDs are safe and effective to use on wet patients as long as the pads are making direct contact with the skin. In addition, it is safe to use on a wet surface. It's safe for the rescuers around the patient. Also, in moving boats, they have found to be effective in, in monitoring, analyzing, and shocking patients. Now on to a controversial topic in drowning resuscitation. I call it controversial only because it's caused a lot of controversy, but the answer is actually pretty simple. The question is, should we do the Heimlich maneuver on drowning patients? The reason why people thought at one time that we should is because they viewed the drowning process as the lungs filling up with water. In reviewing actual forensic research, we found that it's actually a very small amount of water that's aspirated during the drowning process. The large volumes of water that people were reporting getting out from the lungs during uh, the use of the Heimlich maneuver was most likely stomach contents. The bottom line is that the Heimlich maneuver delays much needed ventilations. The time spent trying to rid the lungs of water is time wasted in oxygenation. And when it comes to the standard of care, all the societies listed here all recommend against the use of the Heimlich maneuver in the drowning resuscitation. These days the only person advocating for it is the man in the picture right there, Dr. Heimlich himself. A lot of his research and his evidence has been found to be fraudulent. C-spine immobilization is another technique that tends to get in the way of drowning resuscitation. A lot of effort and a lot of focus is put into immobilizing the spine of someone who's brought out of the water. The actual prevalence of C-spine injuries is actually very low in drowning patients. And when they do have an injury, there's usually a clear sign of trauma or a good story. The bottom line, again, this should not delay primary resuscitation and should not delay giving ventilations to the patient. Now I've spent the last 15 minutes harping on the fact that we need to get oxygen to these patients as soon as possible. So it makes sense that giving oxygen even when you're rescuing the patient from the water could lead to a better outcome. This is called in-water resuscitation. There's a lot of different research on this, but there's two main points. First of all, it has been shown to improve survival and outcome, but this was only in a single study. The most important thing to understand is that it's very technically difficult and should only be done by an experienced rescuer. There are some guidelines put out by the European Resuscitation Council. They say that only if properly trained and ideally with a flotation device and then they give some steps to follow. But again the most important thing to understand is that should, this should only be done in the hands of a trained rescuer and if it delays the overall resuscitation of the patient it should not be done. 
The last topic I'm going to cover is what do we do with these patients once we treated them? Who goes to the hospital? Who goes home? This obviously comes a lot with experience, but I'm going to try to give you some evidence here to help you out. The man pictured here has done more for drowning resuscitation research than most people in the world. His name is Dr. Spielsman, and he is a physician from Brazil. In one of his papers, he reported his findings from his impressive database of over 41,000 patients, in which he correlated initial vital sign and physical exam findings with outcome. From these correlations, he divided the patients into six grades. Group 1 had a 0% mortality. They were characterized by a cough, no foam in the airways, and clear lung sounds on auscultation. Treatment recommendations were releasing with education. Grade 2 and 3 start to have increased mortality, up to 5%. In physical exam, you start to find small or large amounts of foam in the airways, as well as abnormal lung sounds, but with a normal blood pressure. I like to group these grades together because it's hard to tell the exact amount of foam in the airways. So any patient that has, has abnormal lung sounds, any amount of foam in the airways, but with a normal blood pressure, I put it at a grade 2 or 3. Like I said, they start to have an increased level of mortality. Everyone's different with what mortality they're comfortable with. The fact of the matter is these people are much sicker than grade 1 and should probably be sent to the hospital, at least for observation. The transition to grade 4 is characterized by a drop in blood pressure. You can see the single change in physical exam jumps the mortality up to around 20%. These people are much sicker. Treatment for these people, IV fluids if they're available, oxygen as always, and get these people to the hospital. Grade 5 and 6 we know how to treat. That's your respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. Again, very high mortality, very sick, load and go situation, oxygenation, CPR is needed, get them to the hospital. The reason I have the arrows on the chart is because it's important to understand that this is a dynamic process. Someone who comes in as a grade 3 can easily drop down to a grade 4 just by subpart treatment. Along the same lines, there's no reason why a grade 4 patient can't become a grade 3 patient with proper treatment. And you see by just making that minor change, their mortality goes from almost 20% to 5%. Well, that's all I have for you. I appreciate your attention. I encourage you to check us out at lifeguardswithoutborders.org. Uh, you can gain some insight into projects we do and also have access to some old lectures that we have on there. Uh, we're also on Facebook and Twitter. In addition, I run a personal blog on drowning.blogspot.com uh, where I try to keep up and review uh, the most recent and most up-to-date literature in drowning resuscitation. So once again, thank you for your attention, and please feel free to contact us through our website if you have any questions.